So we're talking about uh, challenges and lessons learned on farms, and we have four uh, exemplary uh, farmers here to talk about their situation. And, uh, and I looked up, and in the description of this project, this is for the, the camera, it's not for you. That's <laughs> not a PA system. Um, uh, and the system, it talks about you'll learn from their wisdom. And I looked up the definition of wisdom. And it's that knowledge gained by having experience in life. Okay, so that's what wisdom. So if you're starting out farming or you're working with far new farmers, it helps having someone else went through going through the school of hard knocks, right? So, um, I mean, the best way is to do it yourself, but they will give you a jump start. So the way it's going to work today, and it seemed to work really well this afternoon at least, um, they're going to give an introduction, a background context of their farm, and how they started, what they do, where, they're not, where they are now. And then after that, we've got a couple set questions about what were the challenges and how did you overcome them? What, are, what wisdom would you share <laughs> on? And then, and at that point, we'll open it up for questions. And then at the end, in the final 15 minutes, we'd like to talk about uh, what are some programs or professional tools that would be useful to help, th that would have helped them better get over these challenges. And you can also pipe in on that too. Okay, so we're gonna start. Um, So we'll start from that end to this end, and then this is uh, Jean Carver, who um, operates the Imperial Stock Ranch in uh, Oregon. So I'll start your slideshow. So do I have to use this? You do. Because they can't hear it, but we're doing it for the machine. Is that right? <laughs> Let's get this straight. But I'll try to talk loud enough so everybody in the back can hear me. So our story starts. Um, in 1852 on the Oregon Trail, one of those great American stories, when the Hinton family came west to settle in the fertile Willamette Valley, which is the western third of Oregon. Their son Richard was born on the way west, and he grew up. At 19 years old, Richard Hinton left the crowded Willamette Valley for open spaces and the chance to become a livestock operator. That was his dream. He didn't really want to be a farmer. And so he headed over east of the Cascade Mountains into Oregon's interior. It was 1871. He was one of the first European men type settlers, right? White men. The Native Americans were there. But he was one of the first white settlers in our part of North Central Oregon. That's not him on the horse. That happens to be our oldest son, Blaine. He's the next generation. So I shot that picture in 2013 um, with my point and shoot camera in the rain, carrying a photographer around on the back of my quad who was trying to film a documentary. So we kind of do a lot of things at once. That's, that's what ranchers do, right? He filed on a 160-acre homestead claim, set up camp in a cave. We can still go down there, two miles north of where he eventually built the ranch headquarters. He brought in sheep and cattle right away. He started cutting hay in the sub-irrigated meadow bottoms, and he began establishing up on top where there was soil uh, clearing land and piling rocks to establish grain production. So he began a four commodity operation. Over the next several decades, about 30 years, he built his empire, becoming the largest individually owned land and livestock holding in the state of Oregon and one of the biggest sheep ranches in the American West. I documented during the research for the National Register of Historic Places application 35,000 head of sheep on the tax rolls, but of course, they never told the revenuers the truth, did they? And he named it the Imperial Stock Ranch. This is our 147th year of continuous operation raising sheep, cattle, grains, and hay. We recognize that we are temporary stewards of these resources. It's simply our turn. Our headquarters is a National Historic District, the only ranch in Oregon with that designation that's still operating. It's on 22 acres of grounds and buildings, most of which were built during the days of only horsepower. So yes, as we come on board, we have an existing infrastructure to, to run our operation, but it has its limitations since it was all built in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it brings its own challenges. 
our most significant structures and facilities, as well as every crop field. We farmed between four and 5,000 acres, and every field was established by that first gentleman, young Richard Hinton. We benefit every day from his vision, his planning, and his building for permanence in both our structures, in both the diversity of operation, and in the facilities and crop fields. Since childhood, my husband has loved the high desert of Oregon, and it was his dream to ranch in the Oregon desert. He paid his way through college logging. Both his father and grandfathers were loggers. He studied engineering and business. After college, he went to Vietnam. He made a small stake. He came home. He started a business. He bought a small farm in the Willamette Valley. He had hay, hogs, and cows. And as it grew, he needed more space for his livestock. Everything he did in business, he invested in land. And eventually, he had the opportunity to live his dream. And he, too, went over the Cascade Mountains into the big open country and was able to purchase the heart of the Imperial Stock Ranch. Since the late 80s, his entire focus was on implementing leading practices in both grazing lands and crop lands, which facilitated record numbers of salmon returning to our creeks to spawn in a desert environment. He did this because he's a businessman. And he's self-taught in agriculture. He reads nonstop uh, industry literature. So for those of you that are young farmers and ranchers starting out, there's a lot to be gained just by reading all those magazines that tell you about crop practices, strategies, research, what the cow man's doing, what the wheat growers are doing, and so on. He knew instinctively, though, that the healthier the resource, the more abundant the harvest would be. And therefore, the more secure his future for his family, but for all of us, meaning the planet. So what does it look like to see the land win? How will you know? He worked closely with agency partners. We would not have done what we did without our NRCS, Soil and Water Conservation District, um, Fish and Wildlife Department, the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Forestry, and so on. Your agency partners are, in truth, our partners in managing landscape. They bring skill sets we don't have. We produce dry land crops with no irrigation. Traditionally, it was farmed with the summer fallow method. We converted to no-till practices in 96, the entire thing. The first people in our area to do so. It reduced five trips over the field per two-year cycle, reducing our fossil fuel use. We reduced loss of moisture through soil disturbance and evaporation. We've been hearing about this all day. We graze our livestock on those crop fields after harvest. At some point during the year, the animal manure is applied naturally. They walk down and mulch stubble. They prepare the seed bed. They increase litter. We build soil. No-till methods have increased our soil tilth and reduced inputs. We annual crop, avoiding the fallow years so that never is the bare ground exposed to erosion. It's doubled our yields. We sequester 100 pounds of carbon per year per acre with this method, according to the experts, which is about a half a million pounds of carbon a year we're drawing down just on the crop fields. Soil testing assists with our management. We implemented a rotational grazing system across the entire operation. Today, we, farm, or we are operating on about 50 square miles, one contiguous piece. Looks like that. That's my dog. And that's 147 years of domestic livestock grazing, in addition to wildlife impact, and you can see the cover. We live in a semi-arid uh, desert terrain, 8 to 10 inches of annual precipitation. We've created about 100 off-stream water developments, um, so the cattle and, la and sheep don't have to go to the creek. We uh, strategically place the chocolate, the salt and mineral. We all love chocolate, right? You go where the chocolate is, right? So that's where we put it. We're native bunchgrass rangeland that's been grazed for 150 years. The goal is never bare soil. Diverse vegetative cover is our, is our goal. We have about 50 miles of stream that we are stewards of. Um, grazing impacts, vitality, quality, and diversity of plant life. We monitor vegetation. We monitor soils tests. We monitor stream quality and fish counts, as well as birds. And uh, we are the birthplace of salmon. And in the Northwest, how many of you are from the Northwest? Salmon nation, right? All of us. It's probably the greatest indicator species we have of the health of the total system. Very important indicator species. Farmers and ranchers, and I'm preaching to the choir, are the stewards of healthy soil, beautiful grasslands, functioning watersheds, and wildlife habitat. 
We look at the health of the system from ridge top to ridge top. The goal is to capture, store, and safely release water, create a sponge effect, receive the moisture, hold it, and grazing animals help us do that. Our goal is to hold as much water as possible, always avoid runoff, eliminate erosion, um, and avoid uh, siltrate, siltation of streams. So those are sediment catch basins we've built. We've created about 100 of those. We hold water high at the origins of Eater Creeks. We develop springs. Look how high in the rim rock it is. That's why I wanted to do some slides, because it means a lot more than just saying we do spring developments. We do them way up in the top of these canyons. And the wildlife, we put cameras on those, and we can see in a 24-hour period, pull the chip out of the camera, you can see bear, cougar, coyote, cattle, uh, mountain lions, all elk, all coming to drink, a clean drink. And then the water, protected the source, comes to the trough, and then the overrun goes on down and is into the creek, and those creeks are then recharged for year-round running. Utilizing grazing to regenerate landscape, I'm not going to go into that a bunch because that's what we're all about. I'm just trying to give you a brief overview of how we think because really it's your mindset that's the number one asset that you have, how you're going to approach it. Um, healthy soil, quality of water, clean air, our greatest indicator species to the, how the system is working is the return of spawn and spawning salmon. In 1990, we had two salmon return to Buck Hollow a major tributary to the Deschutes River, which is a wild and scenic desert river in Oregon's interior. Two salmon came home. Huge wake-up call. What has stupid man done now? That's kind of how we put it. What part have we contributed, and how can we make a change of that? How can we instead facilitate, lend a hand to nature, and try to work with nature instead of conquering nature? that we'd ever be so arrogant to feel that way, huh? We need to be humble always. Thanks to the mindset change and operating under a conservation management plan, call it a carbon farming plan, whatever name you want to give it, it's all about the soil and it's all about carbon. It always has been. And we've operated under a conservation management plan since 1989 continuously, and that was my husband's vision. A new twist to an old story in the 1990s, I'm going to jump now, so you have to have a harvest and you have to sell it in order to pay your taxes and regenerate your family's future and your community, your state, your region, and the nation. It all starts here and it goes out. We're doing our part, we hope. Um, in the 90s, there were huge challenges for the sheep industry in America. We had um, between 96 and 2000. In a four-year period, 26,000 sheep producers in America went out of the sheep business. Why? Loss of textile infrastructure, the chasing of cheap textile productions offshore, uh, consolidation in the food sector, one buyer commercially for lamb left in all of Western America, pred predation out of control, 40% losses of the lamb crop to coyote kills in 1999 for us because we no longer are urban population, voting population, disconnected from agriculture, doesn't understand the importance. We had to make a lot of changes. We had to change our mindset about how to protect sheep, so we went to guard dogs. That's another story. But similar to the farm to fork uh, movement that reconnects us to our food, I began piecing together a supply chain for fiber because my husband said, if we don't find our own markets for what the sheep harvest is to us, which has been 10,000 years providing life to man. Food, clothing, shelter. Wool, skins, and meat has sustained man. Wool is the oldest fiber to clothe man. The next fiber to help clothe man is 6,000 years later in any significant way. So we felt we had to honor what the Creator has given us. And so I began the journey. In parallel, we began building a direct-to-chef lamb and beef program because my husband said, why don't you do that? That's where the money is, not in the wool. I'm like, oh, do I have to do that too? See, he's the idea man and I'm the worker bee. That's how it works, right? So we built a parallel chain, taking our harvest direct to consumer, both food and fiber. Uh, I'm wearing a lambskin vest in that picture. That's a byproduct of food. That was garbage. Everything we process in a small USDA processing facility, uh, they can't sell against the uh, commercial food chain, so it goes to garbage. So I started bringing them home, and uh, I uh, make them into product. I didn't know if we could sell anything, because I didn't know anything about any of it. 
but I took the essence of who we were and what we did, the ranch's heritage and mindful stewardship of land and animals, put it in our marketing messages and packaging, and connected a growing customer base, not only for food, but textile products, to the origin of those products, just as with food. That was 20 years ago. In an era of outsourcing and disconnect, we brought traceability and accountability. Ultimately, we were in multiple market channels. That's a sweater for the hand-knit market. They make their own. You sell them the pattern and the fiber, and they knit it, right? We ended up in hundreds of stores across the country. Um, we also sold the production yarn to brands to make their own. So that was production yarn delivered to a knitting factory for Ralph Lauren to make the American flag sweater, or J. Crew, or whomever came along. Apparel and accessories, we had our own uh, boutique women's apparel line, wovens, knits, in stores, accessories, and then I was pushed into home textiles. Everything we did was organic. I didn't plan any of it. I didn't have a business plan. I just did what people asked me for and produced it. You can ask me a million questions after this is all over. A beautiful home goods. From farm to fork and ranch to runway, we scaled up while maintaining our intimate connection to land and animals and became the farmer's market of textiles in this country. We attracted brand partners like Ralph Lauren, J. Crew, Ethan Allen, interest from companies across fashion like Eileen Fisher to um, outdoor recreation, Patagonia finally came calling, and sports brands like Under Armour. God made a farmer, I like this, I created that and actually all of this, and sent his harvest to the Olympics. Who would have ever dreamed in 1999 when Dan said, either figure this out or the sheep are gone, that we would end up on an Olympic stage? Who would have ever dreamed? So I'm testimony that miracles happen. Miracles happen. So against great odds, we built the yarn, fabric, and finished goods business in 2012 during the London Olympics. You all probably know, you all know the story. I don't need to say this. Ralph Lauren got in trouble for the Chinese-made Olympic uniforms. They put an army on the ground to say, gosh, could we make them in America? And who with? They called me. And in 2014, Imperial Stock Ranch became the face of Ralph Lauren's Made in America Olympic uniform program for Sochi, and I became the voice of the film that told the story. A lot of things went on. I just want to say certification can become very important today because it's a third-party audit to say, yes, you do do what you say you do. You know, we like as farmers and ranchers for people to trust us. It's neighborly. We help each other out, and it's a handshake deal. But the growing risk to brands and consumers, not just in food but textiles, in our culture today, they need to, we need to reduce the risk. And so becoming audited by a third party and being able to be certified helps take some of that risk away. We became the first ranch in the world certified last spring under this new responsible wool standard which is addressing the welfare of sheep and the land they graze on. And for the 2018 Olympics in Korea that we just had, Imperial Stock Ranch was again named by Ralph Lauren as they chose National Spinning Company's branded yarn program, that's one of the only vertical mill in the US, spins and dies, and they launched an Imperial Stock Ranch American Merino yarn program in late 2015, and that was the opening and closing ceremony knitwear they have been answering the call to help humankind survive for 10,000 years. And we have to honor that timeless gift. So I'll just show you the opening ceremony this year. You probably may have seen it on TV. Um, it's really an honor to work with American manufacturers, American brands, to continue to support American manufacturing. And... Um, this was from 2014, and help strengthen our own communities. I spoke at a global conference a few years ago in Memphis where the, um, the theme was the strength of rural communities equals the power of nations. And what my message has been carrying for 20 years is that it's important for America to have jobs as important as it is for Peru and Bolivia and other countries. We need to keep jobs in America, too, so we can be strong enough to continue to support those around the world less fortunate than us. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean. I can see your passion in this, and maybe I missed it, but what is your background? 
There, well. I was a hurdler in college. <laughs> and fiercely. <laughs> the shortest hurdler in the national championships every year. And so when Dan said, we can't do this anymore, it was in me to say, well, see, my greatest characteristic is I'm damn stubborn. <laughs> and so as a hurdler, oh, everything I did, and I actually coached collegiately and then um, coached internationally too, Division I, everything I did in elite athletics almost prepared me for the challenges of value-added aggregate. <laughs> <laughs> almost. All right. Because that, this is tough. All right. Thank you so much. That was great. Great background. Um, so going from the western region and the northwest, we're going to go to the southern region or the northern part to Kentucky, and we're going to have Andre Barber from Barber's Farm speak about his operation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Barber. I'm from Kentucky, the central part of Kentucky. Uh, I'm going to give you just a brief introduction and background of our farm so we can kind of make sure we have enough time for questions answering later on. I did do an re actual presentation. I've got a few slideshows that's going to be played, I think, throughout the ceremony. But uh, we are four, I'm fourth generation. I have eight bro or seven brothers and sisters. I'm in the middle of eight. My dad uh, was a sibling of 13 brothers and sisters. It was family owned. Uh, the family was able to get the farm as, when they were tenants and sharecroppers. And then uh, in the late 1900s, my grandparents bought the farm. In the mid 1990s, when my grandmother died, my dad bought the farm. He had to buy his 13 brothers and sisters out, and that's how he was able to purchase the farm then. So it wasn't something that was just handed down to us. We actually had to buy, he had to buy his siblings out, which was 13 of them all together. On the family farm, we have always been dairy farmers. We always had hogs, and tobacco was our main cash, cash flow income for the farm for the last 70 years. Up until five years ago, we were tobacco growers. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about tobacco, but they started to buy out like in the mid-1990s to early 2000s. Uh, as a small producer, uh, less than 10 acres, we were one of the few that got cut out five years ago, so tobacco is no longer in a family operation. So during that meantime in the tobacco buyout in uh, 1996, when I graduated high school, because I'm 40 years old now, uh, I, did, I went to college, I cheat the system a little bit. I didn't take all Think every course that you're supposed to in college, I took all the business courses. I talked to my advisors. Until this day, they're still trying to figure out how I got all my main courses without my electives in the four years of college. Because I knew what I was going to do, and I didn't want to spend no more money going to college. So I kind of took a different route and got what I needed to go back home to the farm. So in 2003, I uh, went back to the farm. Uh, I was trying to figure out something to do for my personal self because I had tobacco in every – I don't know if you never remember how tobacco works, but you got all the input in tobacco from January all the way to December of the same year, and you don't get a paycheck until you say you have tobacco the following year in January. And so during that time, I was trying to figure out something that I can do to make me have a better cash flow just for my personal self and not to go all year long without any income coming in and having all the input coming out. So in 2003, when I got married, I decided to do produce. And I got started doing produce with the University of Kentucky. Uh, it was a couple years. I started off in a room uh, of produce or a field probably about the size of this room. I started off small. Within two years, I uh, started going, uh, getting involved with another university, which is Kentucky State University or Langrant College. So I started working with those two, and I've expanded to 10 acres up to this day in produce. So in the early 2000s, after I seen that the produce was a thing to go, uh, we still milk, we still raise hogs, I knew there was still something else to do. I knew that we still had opportunity. Uh, so my uncles uh, used to own uh, dry cleaners. One of them still owns a dry cleaners in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. So I went with his, went to work there for a while in the meantime still. And so I decided that farming is a business. So I, I just took what I learned from working in the dry cleaners, intermingled what I was doing at the farm and made the farming a, a business. And so on the, on the farm, we still have the dairy today still. We still raise our hogs. We still do our produce. And then we're, at, uh, we're about to add catfish here in a few weeks. We're doing value added on our meats. Uh, for everything from our beef, pork, chickens, and rabbits. Uh, like, and like I said, now we're going to do catfish. So now I'm taking doing everything, doing value-added, along with value-added produce that we do. So we make everything from salsas to canned uh, jellies and jams, uh, uh, green beans, corn, and et cetera. So we do a lot of value-added now, and that's where we're at till this day. Uh, right now, my oldest brother, who retired from service five years ago, came back home to the farm, went in partnership with me and Dad on a dairy. So as you, I keep saying the dairy because I have different enterprises on the farm. I have some of the farmers, me and my brother and dad. On the other side of the farm, it's just an enterprise that me and my family do, which is anything from the produce and the proteins. 
And uh, to this day, we we'll have a lot of our market and our, a lot of our products mainly went to farmer's market. We're kind of moving away to farmer's markets and finding niche, niche markets. And our niche markets are actually doing home door-to-door -door deliveries where uh, it's kind of like a CSA, but it's not a true CSA. It's one of our one of our niches that we started several years ago, and you pay weekly or for 20 weeks or 20 weeks. And what we do is they actually deliver it to your door. That means you don't have to meet us nowhere. We actually bring it to you. So we're a Walmart, Kroger, Winn Dixie, whatever grocery store you want to say on wheels. You get your, you get your produce, you get your meats, your jams, jellies, eggs, and also bring in other farmers that's within our community. There's a lot of more family members that have like maybe 10 or 20 acres. So I'll pull a lot of their products in with our product, and I try to make everybody in our community. Uh, some money, so it's not just all about me. I'm actually trying to help everybody else I can because, as farmers, we are our own worst enemies. We always want to be selfish. We always want to try. It's always about me or I. When the farming industry would be in a better shape today if we wouldn't, if we got off of that level of thinking. That's why issues we have now today. And if we got rid of that right now, we wouldn't have to worry to depend on government like we used to. Didn't have to. And that's my goal is not to have to worry about depending on the government. And so up till. From 1990 now to now, we have, we, like I said, we're very diverse. This is where we're at. We're still growing. Uh, we're looking at some other options in the future. Uh, I don't want to say what they are yet because we ain't got started, so I don't want to get too far ahead of the horse. But you can just follow us on Facebook uh, or on uh, uh, Internet. We've got a website, Barber Farm, Barber Farm LLC, and then on Facebook page, it's Barber's Farm LLC, so you can always keep up with us with videos and stuff. I'm going to stop right there because I know there will be a lot of questions. I want to make sure everybody else gets the time to say something. Great, great, thank you. Did you say the size of the whole operation? Uh, the, the, it's 150 family owned and we still lease like another 200 acres for all of the livestock. Okay, but are you still farming on 10? Your produce is on 10? The produce is still on uh, average of 10. Around average 10, okay, great. Hey, can everybody hear relatively well? Okay, you're doing great, thank you. Okay, so now we're going from the south to the north central and Wisconsin. And it's uh, Joe Tamandi, I hope that's the way, and he works in grazing operation. Great. Thank you. Um, I do have some slides up, if you don't mind pulling those up. Good afternoon. Joe Tamandel uh, from Wisconsin. Wisconsin means dairy for the most part. So uh, I dairy farm up in there, and I can visit a little bit about, you know, what our background is, how we got into dairying, uh, and, you know, kind of what our trajectory is moving forward also. Uh, dairy is a capital-intensive business. It's difficult to get into. You know, the majority of what the, the landscape and the dairy market looks like, for those of you that aren't that uh, you know, intimate to it, and Wisconsin's a good example of it, is uh, there are, well, there used to be tens of thousands of dairy farms. Uh, we're now underneath 10,000. We're in, in the 9,000 level. Uh, but there are markets, and there has always been processing. So when we got started farming, there were a good number of spots where we could go with our milk. Uh, on a commodity or commercial level. Uh, so it hasn't always been as big of a hurdle uh, for us getting into dairy because the infrastructure has been there. That's just the nature of dairy. Uh, like say, there, were, there were half a dozen or 10 different milk processors we could have gone to. Uh, in fact, in the time back in the day, uh, you could actually check each one out and look for the one that's gonna get you its best price. Uh, so it was, it was a competitive thing from the processors. So a little bit about my background is uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in north central Wisconsin, Medford to be exact, uh, and it was a smaller dairy, about 50, 60 cows that we milked, you know, probably only 50 at that time. I went on to school and became a, a high school agriculture instructor. Uh, so I taught high school ag. Uh, my wife was also a teacher, uh, but we always wanted to go back to the farm. Uh, she had come from a farm also. Uh, so after four years of teaching, my wife taught two, we cashed in our entire teacher's retirement, uh, which wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> and we purchased a farm. So this isn't our home farm. This is a farm uh, that's about two miles from where I grew up. And it's a modest farm. This is actually two years after we had purchased it. Uh, the farm we had bought um, was actually, it sat vacant. Uh, the barn itself did, sat vacant for about six or eight years. 
Uh, this was, it's on a dead end road, which I kind of like. Um, and it wasn't the prettiest farm in the neighborhood. In fact, I worked on a farm right up the road. You could see it from there, which was the, the, the real innovative farm in the neighborhood, actually in the county, at the highest herd average in the county. It had uh, innovative equipment and management practices that it brought in in the 80s, uh, and it was just right top notch. It was the type of farm that you'd learn about in college uh, in all your ag classes. Uh, however, when it came time to purchase this farm, <laughs> the numbers just didn't work. And, and as my wife and I looked at this, and the farmers that were there, they were so committed to that farm day in and day out, and there was hardly a way to get away from it. Um, we said, it, this just isn't going to, this isn't the one. So right up the road, which I think was something that intrigued probably the neighbors, is we picked the very modest one. And the thing about it that we were going to be utilizing is managed grazing to get this going. It didn't take the overhead, because when you're looking at dairy, it takes buildings, it takes equipment, it takes land, it takes concrete, it takes manure storage, and you just don't have that kind of money to get started. We also saw the efficiencies of managed grazing. We looked at a world kind of a level at who is the least cost producer in the world, who sets the global market, and these are countries that practice managed grazing. So we thought if we're going to stay in this for the long run, Let's try and learn from them. And in fact, I didn't use a whole lot that I learned in college to get this going. My folks had started managed grazing back in the 80s, so I got a pretty good idea. Basically, for those of you that um, may not be familiar with managed grazing, uh, the way it works, so this is, I'm looking for my little pointer. Oops, that's not a pointer. Look at that. So there's our farm. This is the original 80 acres of land that we had purchased with this farm. Uh, this is 125 acres that came up for rent in 2004, uh, right on the back end of it. When we looked at this land, we said, well, we could take this. And like we learned in school, or like what a lot of the neighbors in, in traditional farming would do, we would come in here, we'd hire the equipment out, we'd plow it, we'd disc it, we'd harrow it, we'd pick rocks. We'd drag it, we'd pick rocks again. Uh, we would seed it, we'd roll it, uh, we'd wait for the crop to come, and then... Oh my goodness, we have rocks. No, no, we have, we have rocks. These are... That's a rock pile. There's a rock pile there. These are the little ones. In, in fact, in our area, you usually see big old, right over here is what they call a stone hole where they would dig deep holes and push all the rocks in, and then there's little duck ponds left over. Those are stone holes. So, yeah, we got rocks. That's one of the, that's one of the coolest things about managed grazing. We don't have to pick as many rocks. So, anyway, getting back is, so what we would do is, is rather than doing all this, waiting for the crop to come up, hiring a whole other set of equipment to cut the feed, rake the heat, feed, chop it, haul it all the way around to here and put it in that silo or in a pile where we'd wait for it to ferment. We'd then pull it out, uh, we'd feed it to our cows, and then we'd bring all the manure back here. That is the typical way you do it. We said, you know, that's too much. Uh, we've got poly wire, grass has roots, cows have feet, let's just walk the cows there. So that's what we did. And here come the cows on the way over from our farm. It is across the section. It's a mile. But they can do it. They're just fine. Uh, the cows look good. It works. You know, there's a couple slow ones, but that happens. And all it takes is this poly wire. If you could see it here, little pigtail post poly wire. These cows know where they need to go. You know, I can remember back when I taught, I went back to one of our students' places uh, and they, they went into the, a conventional industrial type of a model, uh, and they had kind of a dry lot behind their 400 cow dairy, and it was about a four acre f lot, and I went to see this, and they, he looked, and, and the one student, he's a very intelligent guy, and he's like, look at these trails, these cows use the same paths coming back to the barn all the time. They had never seen a cow path, and never knew that cows would line up and follow each other. Uh, they just didn't Comprehend that. Cows have always been kept in the barn so long. So anyway, we'll keep moving on. Uh, so managed grazing was the key. As we got the farm rolling, 
Uh, it had turned in, it went from an 80 acre farm. Uh, we had uh, upgraded the milking facilities in 2000 also. We brought on that extra chunk of land. This is what winter housing looks like, very simple. We did feed at that time some corn silage uh, and baleage and different feed in the winter. We were a seasonal farm too, so we freshened everybody and had our calves in the spring, which is another out of the box kind of a thing. That's not what traditional dairy did. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we've got uh, the farm in about 2009. We had about 320 acres put together. We only owned about 120 of it. I take it back, 160. Uh, we rented the rest of it. Uh, at, in 2010, we had about 180 cows also. You know, currently we've got about 220 cows there right now. Um, but in 2010, we looked at this, all right, how do we continue to invest in this thing? And the way we learned in school was that well, you add another 150 cows onto this. You add more manure storage, you add feed storage. You build on, re renovate your parlor. And the numbers would work. And that's what we learned in our farm management classes. And then you know what, in about seven years, you'd do it again. And we'd be at 600 cows and we'd go through the whole same thing. By the time we'd be ready to retire, we'd do it again. We could have 1,200 cows, $10 million of buildings and concrete and when we're ready to sell this thing out, who's the buyer? Right now, it looks like it could be the processors. We're not going to transition this to our children. And we're going to sell it lock, stock, and barrel, and we're going to leave the whole thing with the dog. And that's it. And that's what we'll leave in the community. We didn't really want to do that, but we wanted to continue going. So knowing what we knew with managed grazing and where we wanted to leave things, we said, rather than double this, let's duplicate this thing. There's these 200 and 300 acre farms all over in our communities. So why don't we just do it again? So here's a farm four miles up the road, 210 acres, uh, a traditional barn uh, by all standards. This is what a traditional Wisconsin barn looked like. This was two weeks after we bought it. There were 50 cows in these stalls two weeks before that. Uh, and that's just where they stayed. You milked them, the calves were at the pen, and, and you know, they'd, they'd go outside and stuff for exercise, but all the feed was brought back to them. To run that farm that exact same way, bring all the feed back, it did not work. I didn't have the cash to buy this thing. We pushed all of our chips back in. Uh, so if we would fence this, put lanes, water lines in, renovate that barn and put an efficient parlor and throw 150 cows at it, now it works. So that's what we did. And we went through, that's the barn, actually, the stall barn. We put an efficient, it's a New Zealand style milking parlor. That's basically that same direction that the picture is taken. So it allows us to milk cows quickly uh, and makes us move forward. So right now, this is 150 cows and 210 acres. Uh, we did an organic conversion on this in 2011. Actually, our home farm, we also did an organic conversion uh, the year before that. So both farms are now. Uh, organic uh, and in fact uh, they're going all grass here right now uh, so there'll be no grain fed uh, it's just one way to try to keep ahead of things our hands were forced with that one a little bit it's okay you know we can get into that a little bit more uh, as we move along uh, so managed grazing is the key you know that's what got us going that's what got us started uh, when we start talking more about the challenges the important things that people need to know it's education and it's skills. It's experience. You can find capital, you can find land. And a lot of people argue, say that's the toughest thing to do. Experience is the toughest thing. That's what's gonna accelerate you on, uh, and connections. In 2009-10, we looked at, all right, how do we bring this next generation on? How do we find the next managers for our farm? Because when we built that second farm, what we're gonna leave in our wake is two farms that an independent family can still own that are economically and environmentally sustainable. We could milk 1,000 or 2,000 cows someday. It just may be on 10 different farms. And when we're retired, ready to retire, we can cash them out one at a time and leave 10 family businesses in the neighborhood. Where do these farmers come from? This Apprenticeship program that we created is to address a lot of those issues and needs. This is a first in the nation formally registered apprenticeship program where individuals work on a dairy farm for two years, 4,000 hours, 300 of those hours are classroom related instruction. The idea is to identify, 
train and give experience to this next generation of dairy farmers who can be the people that will move on to help manage or where we can transition dairy farms down to. We didn't want it to be a flash in the pan, and so we moved it on to a national program. So in 2015, this is the only federally registered apprenticeship in agriculture that was out there. Uh, and we are currently in 11 different states. We've got 150 farmers who are approved to be master dairy grazers. Um, and they can bring an employee or we've got a whole list of people that are interested in dairy that they can choose from. This is the way and our solution to try and bridge that gap to find the next generation and to find all these opportunities for land access and land transition uh, and education uh, in dairy. So that's one of the other pieces that we have worked on. So, okay, there you go. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, and uh, the next speaker is Guy Ames. And so we're going from the top of the country near the Canadian border down to Texas in the south. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Arkansas, I read. That's <laughs> sorry, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I'm from the northeast, okay. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, Guy has Ames Orchard and Nursery. Well, this has been really interesting because um, I love that there's all this geographical uh, difference between us and uh, or among us. And there's also a huge difference, you know, how we got started. And I started with nada. Uh, I'm an old hippie, but once I was a young hippie. <laughs> so. In uh, 1971, I'm also a veteran. I'm a, a Vietnam era vet, but <clears throat> in 1971, uh, the Vietnam War was still roaring right along, and uh, <clears throat> being a young hippie and being against the war, uh, a lot of other things hippies did back then, <laughs> I decided that I had to farm. I just, we really thought, myself and my friends really thought that this war was so bad, so ugly, you know, I don't know what I have to say, napalming of children, that should be enough. Uh, that we just thought it was going to collapse of its own accord. And we were going to go, you know, move somewhere else and uh, grow our own dental floss, our own shoestrings, and <laughs> drop out of society. And you can guess how that turned out. But uh, I didn't have any money, and uh, my brother didn't really have any money either, of course, and uh, friends didn't either. So <laughs> we took all, a lot of nothing and added it up and uh, bought some Ozark land because it didn't cost much more, more than nothing. It wasn't worth much more than nothing. So the Ozarks are uh, altasols. They're some of the poorest soils in the country. They're severely weathered. Uh, it's mostly just upraised rock. And, uh, and then we have all the heat and humidity of the South, as Andre and I were talking about. Uh, so it's, it's quite a challenge. And I didn't have any background whatsoever. I was brought up as a Navy brat. And... Uh, was, you know, in liberal arts in college, so I had this history and English background, which serves you real well in farming. <clears throat> and I had the fortune and misfortune of being, you know, this was when I was going through this uh, uh, change in my life and thinking what I had to do. Uh, I was a bookworm, and I ran across Helena Scott Nearing's book. I ran across the first Wendell Berry essay I'd ever seen in the last Whole Earth Catalog. It was 1971, the very first Mother Earth News, number one, which I still have. So, uh, my girlfriend and myself, we pulled the little, we had 6,000 bucks. We were able to buy with that, with 3,000 of that, we bought uh, 40 acres. <laughs> that was $75 an acre uh, of Ozark, Ozark land, which was probably worth less than that. But, <laughs> but anyway, you couldn't even buy that now, and that's, land uh, is a serious problem. Well, anyway, do we have some slides? I should have, I, I gave some to Sammy. Yeah. It's not really a story. I can cycle through, so I don't know if I'll... Okay. I'll get through, but I don't think it will. So here's what happened. And uh, how many of you are really starting with nothing? I mean, there's a few farmers. Okay, good. I'm speaking to somebody out there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, we bought this land. It was absolutely worthless for agriculture, but it was real party. So we had fun for a while before we realized we didn't know 
enough to even begin to make a living. And uh, what you had back then, you had no Sayre, you had no Atra, uh, you had Rodell publications. Rodell didn't even have the research institute at that time. And most of the information, as it were, uh, was anecdotal and, uh, and not too reliable, uh, especially for those of us in the South or maybe even out West. It may have worked for the folks up in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, but it wasn't working for us. And because I'd read too much, um, I decided I had to do trees. I'd read uh, J. Russell Smith's Tree Crops, which is the precursor really the inspiration for permaculture. Uh, so I knew I had to grow trees, so I thought I'd grow apples. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that. But again, I didn't know. Rodell and my own uh, inexperience taught me that this was going to be a walk in the park. I just wouldn't spray, and, and I'd have all these great unsprayed organic apples. And those of you who <laughs> have tried that anywhere... <laughs> Anywhere in the eastern United States, you know what a pipe dream that was. Um, <clears throat> let's keep going through, because there's one I want to show you, and we'll just linger on it for a while and, and show you what I ended up with. I, I have an orchard and a nursery. What I had was, I had a, a decent brain. I hadn't completely warped it in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> and uh, I knew I could learn, and I knew that I didn't have a lot of capital. So, yeah, go back to that catalog cover, because this kind of says it all. Ames Orchard, fruit for the Ozarks, and it's specializing in disease-resistant apple, pear, grape, blah, 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 blah. So I figured out that what I had to do was grow the things. If I was going to go organic and I was going to go fruit plants, perennials, I didn't want to disturb the soil. This seems to be a theme. And uh, I was going to have to find the right things. And this wasn't easy back then. It really wasn't easy at all. If I have any lesson to impart to you guys now is study. It's here. It's not that hard to find now. Sayre's here. Atra's here. We can help. I work for Atra too, by the way, because I still haven't figured out how to support myself full-time farming, but actually we did for a while. We did. So that was back, that was 89 and 90 when we started that. That was a catalog business. There was no internet. You got to remember this, no internet. So uh, we had to really work hard to get our name out there and <clears throat> And uh, find out all these things that we could grow because it just wasn't, it wasn't there for the Ozarks. It wasn't even really there for the South. So it's taken me a lifetime uh, to figure all this out. And I can't say for sure that I've got it all figured out, of course. But we did, my wife and I at that time made, our, uh, made a living out of it uh, for quite a few years, for about 15 years, 10 or 15 years. And, uh, and then we got divorced. There's another lesson. Don't get divorced. <laughs> if, you, if you're in farming and uh, with the margins that we have... And you're going to have to split that. <laughs> Half of nothing is. What I was able to do, let's go another one. <laughs> let's do one more. I want to see a picture of myself in there. Ah, leave it there, whatever. I love Paul Possum. What I've, what I've done is parlay uh, some skills and some uh, education. Uh, I went back to the University of Arkansas to get a master's degree. I realized that they just weren't telling me what I needed to know in the Rodell books. By the way, I highly recommend this. Don't cookbook it, by which I mean don't look at somebody else's recipe. Try to get an underlying knowledge of the system you're working with, whether it's you know, grazing animals or fruit trees, whatever. Try to understand the basic biology, the ecology even if you're, if you're farming on actual soil. And um, do what works on that piece, on that land, with what you've got. So let's see, I want one more picture of the nursery. That's my son. I suckered him into it. <laughs> but now he'll have the benefit of whatever I've learned, dubious benefit perhaps. But no, we're actually doing well again. I did, after the divorce, I dropped out and taught school for 10 years. But it was English and history. Back to Wendell Berry. Um, but he'll know. Uh, the, really, the point I wanted to make is that I had to go back to the university to understand. And, of course, the university in 1980, the un whole university system was not uh, amenable, was not really sympathetic to organics. And so that was a struggle, too. But I was lucky enough to have a few good professors and, and made it through. And uh, in 1989, Atra moved to Fayetteville, and I was able to get a job there with my master's degree in horticulture. But the way we make money 
is with our brains and some skills. We graft. There should be a picture of me grafting at uh, Earth Dance. I came up and gave them a workshop. No, maybe not. It's not real important. That's good enough. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we really only have about, uh, the most I've ever had is close to an acre of nursery stock. <clears throat> but I can sell every tree that I grow there for about 30, 35 bucks. And of course, before it was different, but we had a different um, cost of living then too. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that we actually make, at the time my wife and I were making a living, it was about an acre and a half of fruit and grafted fruit trees. And we were making a living. We were surviving as farmers. I don't think, and this is one other little thing I'd like to talk about with here or some other over dinner, but <clears throat> one of the things, one of the issues we have is what is success, and we've let people tell us, we've let nobody tell us, it's just out there in the air somehow, that you're a success if you are a full-time farmer. And these days, those of you who said you're just getting started and if you don't have land, being a full-time farmer is really, really tough. And you've seen the editorials and the opinion pieces and stuff. Let's change the definition of success. I'm quite happy with what I'm doing. And it means I work part-time at ATRA. It's great. And I get to do this, and uh, I've started the nursery and the orchard back up. I've got my, like I said, my son suckered into it. He's going to be able to make a living at it because I know what to do. I know how to do that now. But it took a lifetime and uh, a lot of study, but if you've got some brains, work on a skill. If you don't have any money, work on a skill. Get that information. You can only have so many lettuce growers. And if you have to raise livestock, you have to have a certain amount of land. Of course, you can do a whole lot with managed grazing, but still there's limits. You're going to have to figure out how to do it with your brains. I thought I could do it with energy and strength and stuff like that. I'm only this big, so that didn't work out. <coughs> anyway, tough stuff. We'll take questions later, right? Okay. Right. <clears throat> well, I want to thank the farmers for this section of it, and I did let them go on uh, to talk about their farms, and the, so you get the context, and it's late in the afternoon, and it's always much more fun to hear about farms than technical stuff. But now we're going to dig in a little bit and um, ask them to answer a couple questions. And after each question, when they go through and give them what they, their opinions, yeah, I'll take questions from the audience. And my name's Carol Delaney, by the way. And so if I don't see your hand, just say, yell out my name <laughs> so I can uh, get your question, okay? So this section is more uh, them going a little deeper into the challenges they face. They did touch on it in their presentations, but so if you would, all of you, um, think about and answer, what was the greatest challenge when you started farming? And if you've already touched into it, uh, just maybe go in depth about it. And how did you overcome it? And Jean, would you like to? Uh um, okay. Well, we came into an existing operation that <clears throat> was on a decline. So the original man, Richard Hinton, I told you about, passed this ranch on to his son, Jimmy, who was born in the cave in 1874. So he passed on to him in 1915, and then he never had an heir, so one of the men that had come to work for the Hintons in the 1930s was able to buy in and become a partner in 1945 during World War II because of the price of wool. It was $6 a pound back then. So with a loan, George bought into this ranching operation. So <clears throat> time goes along, George becomes sole owner, and then in 1967, um, you know, he became sole owner. So in 1988, he sold the heart of it to us. And we got a place that had a small number of sheep, a couple hundred head of cattle on it. It was an aging operation. When someone begins aging, when they've got a farming operation and the kids aren't there and they don't know what's going to happen, things start to go downhill pretty fast. So when we came in there, one of the things we did was try to decide how to maximize the resource. That was my husband's thinking. A, how to see the land win. 
because that is the bottom line important. This place has to be productive now and going forward to assure the future. So how do we utilize the whole factory? He likes to term it as a factory, and I always hate that when he does it because it, it's too industrial a term for a beautiful wilderness, right? But how do you make the land win? And we cleaned up the infrastructure, framed up or, or uh, supported the existing infrastructure, so we put nothing into infrastructure in terms of buildings. The one thing we had to do was fencing, which can cost you $10,000 a mile to build. We had to invest in fencing in order to manage the grazing, and we put in permanent fencing as opposed to portable because it's a big, it's a big country. We operate on a, a pretty big scale. So we had to uh, upgrade the fencing and bless them. That's where you can get some help with your agency partners in cost share. We were able to get cost share projects to help us with the fencing in order to um, manage the grazing rotations for the livestock. So the greatest challenges was really putting in an infrastructure in terms of ability to manage the rotation, the rest, the timing of the grazing in order to utilize the whole ranch because when we took over 50 square miles, there was two areas. That's where you had the livestock in the summer and that's where you had them in the winter. Summer and winter. Imagine that for a couple of decades. So we had to find a strategy to move the livestock across the entire 50 square miles and, and assure the appropriate use of the grass and the rest in rotation and try to revitalize the grasslands. That was our biggest challenge. And the other thing was the cropping practices. Traditional summer fallow. Farm it a year, leave it fallow a year. And in that fallow year, you talk about invader species and then having to harrow it or disc it and then harrow it and pick rocks. And I'm glad somebody else has rocks. And so the conversion to no-till limited our input costs. We reduced all the expense of all those additional trips over the field. We also, by def we also ended up with um, reducing all the evaporation from all that soil disturbance. We kept all our litter on the fields. So we were able to double the crop harvest in a matter of just a few years limit and reduce our input costs, maximize the grasslands by strategically placing those salt supplements, developing those off-stream water, and by the way, all those sediment catch basins we built and spring developments, we got cost share on that too. So when there are government programs, which I know we said it'd be great if we didn't have any, but they can really help you with activities that not only facilitate your management, but help the land thrive. So developing those off-stream water sources and getting all that fencing in place, and then Dan's decision to convert to no-till were the hugest things we did. So today we have a thriving, pretty, a pretty thriving landscape with, with doubling um, carrying capacity or tripling our carrying capacity in livestock and doubling our crop harvest. That's probably the greatest thing we had to do was support that in, the existing old infrastructure and upgrade it. When you say greatest, are you talking about good or bad? <laughs> the hardest, hardest challenges. Yeah. Okay, well, mine's going to be a tad bit different. As a, as a black farmer, as an African American farmer, ours was breaking barriers because when I say breaking barriers, I think people f intend to forget history because the farm, the farm workers, the farm labor was blacks already. And I think as time transitioned, America forgot who kept America going. And now that we're b going back, uh, the, uh, there are more black farmers doing more on the farm where it's actually theirs. So they're going into the public and going to the cities and selling a product like we do. We have a, we have a, a Ted, bigger step that we have to, to break when we with talk to our customers. 95% of my customers are white. And so when I go to these farmers markets and I sit up, especially for the first time, like when I stepped out in Kentucky, uh, parts of Kentucky and down in Nashville, Tennessee, where we did our markets, where they would come to your table, look at you, walk off, and then they go look at everybody else's stuff and they come back. And then once they got to talking to you, realizing you, you, had, you have to change their mindset. And so one of the things that we have learned, had, that we learned is, one, you have to learn how to talk right, talk well, be presentable, and have the best product. 
You got to be. You got to have a product that sets your your product uh, uh, different from our else's product. Even though it's the same product, you got to say your product and why it's better and produce it better. And and not only that, we'd have to argue with other with even with even as is uh, dealing with the, uh, our African American community or Black communities. They would sit and argue with me, tell me I wasn't a farmer. I worked for somebody. They still couldn't believe that we still own land, that we didn't give our land up. And, you know, so we catch, we catch hell, might as well say, on both sides of the fence. But once you get that broke and get everyone back to being educated and run it, remembering back in history, nothing's really changed. It's that we just got forgot about. And so that was one of the uh, TV shows we did in Louisville. Me and my partner, Mr. Jewell, he's also a farmer and also works with the university, Kentucky State University. And we did a live show on a, a live television show in Louisville, Kentucky that aired across Kentucky. And one of those episodes was Breaking Barriers. There's still a lot to be done. We're still going to do it. It's not going to stop me. But at the same time, that great, that, that, that issue actually made me stronger, made me better, and actually gave me more in life and gave me uh, a higher standards to reach for and make our business better. And to me, it's not a downfall. To me, it was, it was my strength. And every day I still look back and still how to make ourselves better and keep moving forward. So my challenges aren't nearly as deep. Uh, and as I look at those two, I got more of a, you know, just a uh, surface level challenges like a lot of farmers would and uh, just like a lot of people they look at their challenges of you know just making the decisions of deciding what your trajectory is you know there's other simple challenges just of finding enough time in the day to get your stuff done uh, getting a farm started and getting it going and I can remember back then uh, it was a lot of long days it was physical days and we find this even with some of the new generation of farmers that we are trying to train is these long days and just the ability to get enough physically done during the day uh, can be a bit of a challenge. And then balance that with wife, uh, young children. Uh, that can all be a very big balancing act. Uh, and then try to really, you know, create that vision of where your farm is going. Uh, so ways around that and ways to help through that, not only with the whole family, even like it's networking with people that have like interests. We were fortunate that we had other farmers in the area uh, that were doing what we're doing. We had grazing groups. Uh, it allowed us to get out to see other farms, to see how they handled things. I looked at purposely at bigger dairies. Uh, back in college even, I worked at the 3,000 cow dairy out in California. Uh, I worked at Stream Rehab out in Oregon too. Uh, for the salmon, which is a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, but um, you know, just to take a look at the bigger models to see, right, how do you manage these, and what can I learn from that in my smaller model here, and where could I maybe bring in outside help down the road? So those were things that helped us overcome some of those challenges, just to get our head around everything and create that vision. Uh, that's a big piece of this also, is know where you're going, uh, and it helped by leaning on other people and seeing where they were heading for. I think I've already uh, mentioned what I think uh, the biggest uh, impediment I had, and that was just ignorance, just plain ignorance. I had no capital either, but you know, ignorance turned out to, to be even more important impediment <laughs> because with, a, with enough ignorance, you can lose a, what little capital you can accumulate. So, so that's, that's basically it. What I would advise you to do is just really understand. Do everything you can to educate yourself. Try to learn. It's out there, you know, but, it, you know, a lot of this is specialized knowledge, and when you start to, I'm thinking about those of you who raised your hands and said you're starting with nothing. You know, I assume you're starting with nothing. I just ask who's just getting started. If you're starting with very little or nothing, uh, it's easy to lose it all. <laughs> so, uh, but I do want to tell you this one real quickly. Uh, this fellow in Arkansas, I won't mention names, and I, I, he made a fortune uh, doing, uh, making a computer program that a lot of you have used, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because you'll figure out who this guy is. He has lost a fortune trying to farm. And uh, Luke, I don't know this guy. <laughs> There's a couple people here who know this guy. Uh, he's a really nice guy, but he really thought he came into this, into farming, thinking that, that the farming part was easy. He really did. He thought, I, I, you know, I'm a marketer. I know how to market this stuff. 
And farming's easy. You just put the seed in the ground and stuff. He has lost his wife. His kids don't speak to me anymore. They've left. He has lost millions, and I'm not exaggerating, millions. And uh, there was a, he asked for a group of, of uh, professionals to come down and, and tell him what he needed to do. You need to hire somebody who knows, knows this stuff. <laughs> you need to hire somebody who knows how to farm, knows horticulture in this case, you know. So don't underestimate the power of education and, uh, <laughs> you know, the absence of it. Or in my case, I think, you know, I'm very happy with it. I'm not making tons of money. I won't ever be a millionaire with this, but I can make a living, and, and it's good. And I can make a living on a very small amount of land. So these are all possible things. All right, that's all I want to say. All right, thanks for that input. I just want to make a comment on something Jean said. I know in this session this afternoon, uh, Erica Muhammad, she was talking about some advice she got about how you spend your day. Because they're all talking about labor. When I go to farms, especially during the farming height, of the height of the season, I'll say, what's your biggest challenge? And I was thinking like health care or something. And labor is it. So she had this formula she sort of remembered was that 75% of your day is doing what you uh, have to do to operate the farm right then. 15% is what is working on a project for the next year. And 5% is working on a project that will benefit you in the next five years. So it sounds like Jean's family did quite a bit to benefit themselves in the next 25 years. So that's well, important. Finish up on these challenges. In agriculture, we're dealing with moving targets, maybe in every industry. I don't know every industry. But we have challenges that we have to face in every We have new, new uh, invasive species coming because of changes in climate. We have changing water issues. We have a stream in our headquarters valley that didn't run this winter for the first time in history. We have no snowpack in the Cascades, or very low snowpack. We have changing factors. We have changing regulation and trade policies. Markets change. Um, we have so many things. So I guess the number one thing we need to be, and it kind of goes along with what you said, Guy, besides being self-educated, which I mentioned my husband reads constantly on industry-related journals, is being good observers. We have to really pay attention to what's happening on the ground. And we, it's never, you're never going to arrive. You will never arrive because it's always a moving finish line and target. Great, thank you. All right, so if, if you're ready to ask any questions, raise your hand. Okay, one right here, Lydia, and I'll repeat it. Okay, so for the camera, uh, the question is about uh, dairy farming is challenging today. How do you see yourself keeping it solvent now and in the future? Joe? I want to learn from Andre. <laughs> 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 well, like I said, uh, dairy has always been in operation for 70 years in our family, and we have always been a pasture-grazed dairy, so a lot of this pasture that you hear see is not new to us. It's, we've always done it. And so for us, to, for us to be where we're at now is because of that. We don't use free stalls. All of our animals are out 12 months of the year. They're outside. They're grazing. Uh, we have woods that we remove our hay in or corn salads that we chop for in winter if the winter does get harsh. If it gets real harsh, we will open up our tobacco bars and let them get in for the shelter. But as far as trying to survive, we try to have the least input as we can, try to be most humane as we can. Uh, we have this, they drink, we have water systems across the farm, so the water that we drink out of in our city water, our livestock drinks the city water as well because we have waters all on the 150 acres. Uh, we try not to bring any outside feed unless we have to. We feed a little bit in our barn when we, when we do milk the cows. And one reason for that is because that's how they get their other nutrients and microorganisms that we can't just give them uh, plenty of from pastures. We put add that in, additive in our feed so they can get that. And But as far as like that, uh, the rest of it, 
I also serve on the Dairy Farmers America board. That's who we're with. So we had a corporate meeting last week. And really, it's farmers are your gamblers. We're, we live by gambling. And that's the only thing we know is the gamble. So <laughs> uh, as far as the future on that, it really depends on the public and, and you as consumers and purchasers and buyers. You actually making our future, whether you quit purchasing milk and buying fake milk like soy milk, there's no such thing as soy milk, number one. Like, we can get that straight now. You can't milk with soy, all right? I mean, if you don't want to know the truth, don't ask me here today, I'll tell you now. <laughs> well, well said, too. And, and that's true, you know, things, things change so quickly, you know, as I, and one reason why I brought that point up, what dairy looked, looked like in Wisconsin when we got going, uh, is that there was almost a competition from the processors for your milk, and you could even switch processors. That isn't like that anymore. And, it, and a lot of this has just happened in the last couple of years. Uh, we've got such an oversupply of milk out there, uh, and a lot of it comes from industrial agriculture too. So many times we've looked at, and this is as we're building any of our farms, and we've tried to do this also, is try to be ahead of the curve, try to be innovative, try to look ahead, be ready to adapt so we are mobile. That was some of the reasons why we use managed grazing. It, it allows us to be mobile, uh, and it allows us to be a least cost, but also hit some of these other markets potentially that are coming up. So whereas organic is a safe haven, maybe was a safe haven uh, as much in dairy, uh, that market is incredibly flooded too right now. Uh, so we're even having some real issues with that. That's one of the reasons. So we, we converted our farms to organic uh, just in the last few years here. We've always been grass-based. It was a business decision to move toward that to get some more stability. Uh, this market has just totally collapsed, and ours personally, about three weeks ago, got cut by another 20, 30 uh, percent, and then we got quotas instructed on us. Uh, so us, because we had just gone through it, uh, and we were just tooling the farms back up, our quota that got thrown at us was about one and three quarter million pounds less than what we're projected to produce. But the upside is they give us five dollars a hundred weight for whatever we overproduce. Milk goes for twenty twenty two dollars right now a hundred weight. So we get penalized basically that seventeen bucks a hundred weight uh, for anything over our quota. We could not do that. Uh, it would have gutted us. Uh, so uh, by being grass based, we're now making our move to this all grass market. That market is there. We're fortunate it's there. We're making a, a jump to that. We've always had it on our radar. We've been breeding uh, New Zealand type of animals. Um, you know, we're also watching other markets. We're, always, we're breeding pulled. We're breeding A2. We're watching for any market that we could bounce into. One of the reasons for our decentralized farms is I may milk a thousand cows someday. I may have a tanker load or two of milk, which I think is what it may take. Uh, I may own my own tanker. Uh, but I can have the ability to have a big enough pool of milk to keep attracting processors. Uh, and possibly, if small markets do, I can segregate a couple of these farms to go to an A2 market or something else. So that's how we're trying to keep you know, on, you know, uh, our head above the water also. But this has, been, this has been a blow here right now recently. You're never there. You always got to keep innovating. A2 is just another market. Who knows if it'll come? Uh, it's just a, it's another type of a milk market where it's based off of uh, a, a different fat profile in the milk that is uh, typically a lot more digestible and a lot more healthy, depending on you know which uh, research you're reading and and, uh, and where you're at. The thing is, is why I'm not as interested in that market necessarily is because industrial egg you can you can produce A2 milk in a freestall. Uh, and what's happened with organic is they've allowed for five and 10,000 cow dairies to be certified organic. So right now, just a handful of dairies produce half the milk in organically in this nation. So it just completely put a, a, a blanket over a lot of this. Yep. One more thing I forgot to mention on that too is also your breeds of cows. 
because you get extra money for a different product that's in the milk, like your butter fat. So what we started doing was adding, we our, predominantly heard is Hosteins. So what we did was start adding more jersey to get that extra 25, 30, 40 cent on per hundred weight. So you got to see the whole picture and bring in other breeds of the loss of the dairy industry that offer different product in your milk to make, to make you get the full dollar of your milk. Sure. So the question is differentiating uh, grass, small farm, organic, grass-fed versus industrial level. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so right now, anything under that organic label is in the same pool of milk. That's the tough thing that's going on right now is you've got uh, these other large, large dairies coming in uh, and, and operating underneath that label. Uh, there is, however, a different label for 100% grass. That means no grain. Uh, we don't you know, that's, like, that's a heck of a learning curve that we're going to be up against. You know, we've been watching it for quite a while, but just in regards to cow condition, getting them bred back, and just a whole variety of things, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to do it. I mean, that's the other thing. As, as a farmer, you need to get through these things, and you can't quit. You need to figure out how you get it done. And i got to be able to tell my whole crew at home now, too, we will do this. One way or the other, we will make it through it. And you figure out, you just don't quit. And I think that's what you get back to. It's that yeah, competitive I, piece. I had a comment, if I would, because one of the things that Dan's always tried to do is control your own market, control your own destiny. Every time you're selling commodity, it's out of your control. So we've worked really hard to take our coal cattle and market them specifically in a different way and add value. The steers that don't fit when we have a lot, a lot of cattle that's going to Whole Foods, and certain when you're selling lots of, of um, into, even into a program like that, there's some that aren't gonna fit, right? And so we market those directly to chefs. And so the key there is relationship building. The, the labels are gonna keep changing, the rules are gonna keep being impacted, and as soon as, as soon as something starts to work in the consumer trend, all the industrial big players are gonna jump in to capitalize. You know, when microbrews became a big segment, the big brewers, beer companies started buying up the microbrew brands, right? So they're always gonna be after controlling everything. So what you do is you find the partners that work for you, and you build relationships and you work together in those relationships. And that's, this is just one small example in Fiverr. Ralph Lauren came back to a relationship four years later. They didn't have to, but they did, um, and in other ways. And, and that's true in food. We have a family of about 35 restaurants that consume all our lamb production, and we meet with them annually, and we're committed to each other. Um, it's pretty tough to contract it that way, but the, that does happen. And you know, the, the more vertical your supply chain can become from grower to retailer, with every partner in the system a part of it and at the table, working together to strengthen each other in multi-year commitments, the better you are. But relationships are everything. Agency relationships, neighbor relationships, right? Um, but, but your marketing relationships, and agriculture is a small industry. So, you build good relationships, you treat people honestly, you be transparent, and hopefully you stand together. So don't go into farming if you don't like people. Also. <laughs> okay, we're running near the end, but I wanted to get to the second question and still have more come in. And But, so the second question, if you want to share, and you've been sharing your wisdom, I think they've done a great job. But if you would, um, what are, what's the most important lesson every beginner farmer rancher should know? Uh, yeah, just choose one. The most important lesson is uh, to realize, one, you're not going, it's not a rich quick scheme. That's number one. Uh, the number two is you can't do it alone. When I say can't do it alone, for us, if it wasn't for Kentucky State University and University of Kentucky, both of them are specializing in different things on the farm operation on different, different sizes, different levels, different enterprises. 
if you can't get them involved in what you want to do, then you really don't have a future or a goal because you don't know where you're going, you don't know where you're headed, you don't know where you're going to fall back to. That's number two. And number three is um, she uh, just mentioned a few minutes ago that if you don't work with your neighbors, uh, get get uh, have, be a people person, be ready to talk, sell, because as a farmer, you are a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're you're an animal dentist, you're you're all the above without getting degrees. And if you don't have the time to learn all that, to, to have patience with animals, to have an animal husbandry, then also know how to be a husband or a wife or be a father or a mom, be an aunt or sister, take time out to be with family. My uncles always say it's cheaper to keep her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to follow up. <laughs> but I think, yeah, some of the most important lessons are, you know, really surround yourself with people of, uh, on the same pathway or of like interests uh, and get as much education knowledge before you take out that big loan too. You know, and that is one of the reasons why we created this formal apprenticeship program also is to really try and bridge that gap where you can start learning. You're not just an employee on one of these farms where you're following a job book and you're going through all pieces of it. Uh, everything from calf management to feed budgeting to whatever it may be. Try and learn as much as you can uh, before you jump totally into it. And when you're in it, uh, continue networking. Networking, networking, networking with people and, and have a vision and you just plain don't give up. Uh know why you're doing it and this i'm going to say two things because they're related i've i've dropped wendell berry's name several times and living the good life and these other things you know they, they were great books and they fired me up and i went into it thinking like i said that we were gonna you know be completely self-sufficient farmers you know i was ignorant and uh but what sustained me truly was the beauty of it and that's still what sustains me the, at the end of the day every day i walk around my farm and i look at the trees and i look at the fruit that's maturing i look at the blossoms right now this time of year and it keeps me going if i this is i've lost a lot of money <laughs> and uh, a lot of time and people say well, why don't you grow right now the market's great for carrots i don't care about carrots i mean i eat them if somebody throws them in a salad I love what I do, and I will continue to do that even if I'm not making a lot of money. If I have to have a part-time job, I'm okay with that. I don't think, for me, the definition of success is that I'm farming full-time. Actually, I think I know how to do it now. I'm not even sure I want to. Related to this is your spouse, your partner. And this is even more so farming, let's Wendell Berry again, vocation, voc vocal a calling it's a calling a calling from god if you will so we're motivated by some notion of a higher purpose to begin with and for those of us who are in sustainable or organic farming it's even should i say worse let's say more so <laughs> let's say it's more so so if you go into it and you have this almost missionary zeal to make the world a better place by being an organic farmer and you're it's going to be hard you're going to sacrifice, and you're going to work long, weird hours doing weird things <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't see in that Wendell Berry novel. You know. uh, make sure that your partner is as committed to you or, at, 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 to this as you are, or it's probably going to be impossible. Tough, anyway. Uh, in the in the produce world. It works a little different. You can't just grow because you want it. You got to make sure you got a market for it. And number two, you got to grow what people want. Yeah, there's a whole clinic here on on the marketing. Um, I guess what I would share is what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? What's the most important lesson? Oh, the most important lesson I think has to do with integrity. Stand on your own integrity. Stand on your own integrity. I spoke at a 3D global knitting world conference. Now they had all these MIT engineers and the people that develop software and you know all these whole garment knitting machines, no waste technology and the leading stuff in the world in textiles. I'm like, why are you inviting me here? 
But what I could tell them was about dirt, because that's where it all begins. All the fibers that become our clothing and shelter begin in the soil. In fact, all food, clothing, and shelter, life to humankind, begins in the soil. And so you need to know your own dirt, wherever you are, your unique operation and, and system. Know your dirt. Stand on your own dirt. Take care of your own dirt. Protect it. Because it is your success and your future and the future of the planet is to ensure we take care of our dirt, right? That's it. So we have a few minutes. If anyone has questions to follow up on any of the topic areas or specific questions on the farms, or, okay, in the back there. That's passion, and passion is a real critical part of your success and your future. Um, I didn't start farming till I was 50 years old, and I had a totally different background, but I did have a lot of passion, and it paid off. So, but I think that's a real common thread. Okay. Anything else? One up there, the young man. So, Guy, how would you do it if you could do it again? <laughs> you know, I, I, it's still such a lifestyle thing. I'm not going to give the right answer. I'm going to give you an answer that most experts won't agree with. Get the piece of land that you love. You've got to have a little bit of tillable land. You've got to have something. But I really am. I'm, I'm doing it for the lifestyle. I love the country. I love the plants. I love the paths. I love the, my orchards and stuff. So I wouldn't do that much different. Uh, I would choose the right, if you're going to go organic, which I presume most young people are, you've got to match the crop to the climate and your soils. So, you know, and the other thing I'd say to do, God, I'm just dropping Wendell's name all over the place. You know, he compared um, uh, Kentucky to Switzerland one time in one of his essays and talking about Switzerland has virtually no soils to speak of. You know, what have they got? They've got some brains. You know, they got some skills. And uh, in Appalachia, they had a lot of coal. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know about that story. Anyway, you know, leverage what you have and use that skill. You're not going to be able to beat industrial farming, whether it's, you know, milk or anything else, uh, produce, anything. You're going to have to find some little niche. So I think you could do it on two acres. It's possible. You know, I, like I do, I do it with budding and grafting. Nobody's figured out how to really mechanize that effectively yet. So it's my niche. You might be able to, that niche between the, the varieties that do well, the fruit species that do well, and my neck of the woods, and then that particular skill that, that nobody's figured out how to mechanize yet. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Okay, any last question? Okay, right here. Yeah. So I work at a uh, community college that um, manages a, a three-acre farm, basically, at a community college. And I uh, just wanted to know uh, what you guys think would be the most, what would you do on that farm? Three acres, you know, we've, we've got some fruit and we've got some, you know, berries and about four plots of, you know, maybe three acres of, uh, of vegetable growing. Uh, what's the most important thing for young farmers to get out of that experience? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, we'll finish up with this one question and then tie it up. Golly, yeah. Uh, what's the, what's the uh, on this diverse small three acre college or high school farm, what should the, what should the students learn from it by doing it? They should learn that the, the beauty of growing your own food from seed, just planting it in the ground. And to me, 
the vegetable part is probably the most simplest thing to start off with because I don't do it with fruit trees, but I've been around it. And that's something that she can really lose big time. It costs you more than we'll be just starting off with a few vegetables. And But to seeing them showing the beauty of uh, growing a vegetable from seed and, and find out how nutrition and nutrition is and the way that you take care of it is the better nutrition is going to come be the outcome of a product that you can eat at the end. Yeah, and I, like, I'm a dairy guy, so I don't know if I've got a lot to add. But, you know, just, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to create a – depends what you're trying to create. You're trying to create somebody that is uh, appreciative to food, to soil, and, to, and, and, and everything, or if you're trying to create an entrepreneur. Uh, I think those are where you need to determine what you're trying to do. If you're trying to create an entrepreneur, well, then do a business plan, figure out what you're going to grow on there, and take it to market uh, to create – you know, somebody that just understands food and has appreciation, uh, well, then bring them through the whole process. So let me speak to you from my ATRA experience. You know, we've, I've been doing this since 1989 at, at ATRA, or off and on from 1989. And so we have seen thousands of young farmers come and go. And so I'm assuming these people are coming to you for education because they want a career. And really, this is not my personal thing, but they need business. They need business experience. They need the business plan. They need to know accounting. They've got to really approach it. If that's why they've come to you, that's what you've got to give them. And it's probably probably business stuff. It's no fun, but. <laughs> Great. So it sounds like business planning, um, start slow and small, and get a mentor like one of these wise farmers up here. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>